the creation of terrestrial animals. How did you like the fare of my morning's discourse? It seemed to me that I had the good intentions of a poor giver of a feast, who, ambitious of having the credit of keeping a good table saddens his guests by the poor supply of the more expensive dishes. In vain he lavishly covers his table with his mean fare. His ambition only shows his folly. It is for you to judge if I have shared the same fate. Yet, whatever my discourse may have been, take care lest you disregard it. No one refused to sit at the table of Elisha, and yet he only gave his friends wild vegetables, 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 39. I know the laws of allegory, though less by myself than from the works of others. There are those truly, who do not admit the common sense of the scriptures, for whom water is not water, but some other nature, who see in a plant, in a fish, what their fancy wishes, who change the nature of reptiles and of wild beasts to suit their allegories, like the interpreters of dreams who explain visions in sleep to make them serve their own ends. For me grass is grass, plant, fish, wild beast, domestic animal, I take all in the literal sense. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Those who have written about the nature of the universe have discussed at length the shape of the earth. If it be spherical or cylindrical, if it resemble a disc and is equally rounded in all parts, or if it has the fourth of a winnowing basket and is hollow in the middle, all these conjectures have been suggested by cosmographers, each one upsetting that of his predecessor. It will not lead me to give less importance to the creation of the universe, that the servant of God, Moses, is silent as to shapes. He has not said that the earth is a hundred and eighty thousand furlongs in circumference. He has not measured into what extent of air its shadow projects itself while the sun revolves around it, nor stated how this shadow, casting itself upon the moon, produces eclipses. He has passed over in silence, as useless, all that is unimportant for us. Shall I then prefer foolish wisdom to the oracles of the Holy Spirit? Shall I not rather exalt him who, not wishing to fill our minds with these vanities, has regulated all the economy of Scripture in view of the edification and the making perfect of our souls? It is this which those seem to me not to have understood, who, giving themselves up to the distorted meaning of allegory, have undertaken to give a majesty of their own invention to Scripture. It is to believe themselves wiser than the Holy Spirit, and to bring forth their own ideas under a pretext of exegesis. Let us hear scripture as it has been written. Let the earth bring forth the living creature, Genesis chapter 1 verse 24. Behold the word of God pervading creation, beginning even then the efficacy which is seen displayed today, and will be displayed to the end of the world. As a ball, which one pushes, if it meet a declivity, descends, carried by its form and the nature of the ground and does not stop until it has reached a level surface, so nature, once put in motion by the divine command, traverses creation with an equal step, through birth and death, and keeps up the succession of kinds through resemblance, to the last. Nature always makes a horse succeed to a horse, a lion to a lion, an eagle to an eagle, and preserving each animal by these uninterrupted successions she transmits it to the end of all things. Animals do not see their peculiarities destroyed or effaced by any length of time. Their nature, as though it had been just constituted, follows the course of ages, forever young. Let the earth bring forth the living creature. This command has continued and earth does not cease to obey the Creator. 4. If there are creatures which are successively produced by their predecessors, there are others that even today we see born from the earth itself. In wet weather she brings forth grasshoppers and an immense number of insects which fly in the air and have no names because they are so small, she also produces mice and frogs. In the environs of Thebes in Egypt, after abundant rain in hot weather, the country is covered with field mice. We see mud alone produce eels, they do not proceed from an egg, nor in any other manner, it is the earth alone which gives them birth. Let the earth produce a living creature. Cattle are terrestrial and bent towards the earth. Man, a celestial growth, rises superior to them as much by the mould of his bodily conformation as by the dignity of his soul. What is the form of quadrupeds? 
their head is bent towards the earth and looks towards their belly, and only pursues their belly's good. Your head, O man, is turned towards heaven, your eyes look up. When therefore you degrade yourself by the passions of the flesh, slave of your belly, and your lowest parts, you approach animals without reason and be commerce like one of them. You are called to more noble cares. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits, Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. Raise your soul above the earth. Draw from its natural conformation the rule of your conduct. Fix your conversation in heaven. Your true country is the heavenly Jerusalem. Your fellow citizens and your compatriots are the firstborn which are written in heaven, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 23. Let the earth bring forth the living creature. Thus when the soul of brutes appeared it was not concealed in the earth, but it was born by the command of God. Brutes have one and the same soul of which the common characteristic is absence of reason. But each animal is distinguished by peculiar qualities. The ox is steady, the ass is lazy, the horse has strong passions, the wolf cannot be tamed, the fox is deceitful, the stag timid, the ant industrious, the dog grateful and faithful in his friendships. As each animal was created the distinctive character of his nature appeared in him in due measure, in the lion spirit, taste for solitary life, an unsociable character. True tyrant of animals, he, in his natural arrogance, admits but few to share his honors. He disdains his yesterday's food and never returns to the remains of the prey. Nature has provided his organs of voice with such great force that often much swifter animals are caught by his roaring alone. The panther, violent and impetuous in his leaps, has a body fitted for his activity and lightness, in accord with the movements of his soul. The bear has a sluggish nature, ways of its own, a sly character, and is very secret. Therefore it has an analogous body, heavy, thick, without articulation such as are necessary for a cold dweller in dens. When we consider the natural and innate care that these creatures without reason take of their lives we shall be induced to watch over ourselves and to think of the salvation of our souls, or rather we shall be the more condemned when we are found falling short even of the imitation of brutes. The bear, which often gets severely wounded, cares for himself and cleverly fills the wounds with mullen, a plant whose nature is very astringent. You will also see the fox heal his wounds with droppings from the pine tree. The tortoise, gorged with the flesh of the viper, finds in the virtue of marjoram a specific against this venomous animal and the serpent heals sore eyes by eating fennel. And is not reasoning intelligence eclipsed by animals in their provision for atmospheric changes? Do we not see sheep, when winter is approaching, devouring grass with avidity as if to make provision for future scarcity? Do we not also see oxen, long confined in the winter season, recognize the return of spring by a natural sensation, and look to the end of their stables towards the doors, all turning their heads there by common consent? Studious observers have remarked that the hedgehog makes an opening at the two extremities of his hole. If the wind from the north is going to blow he shuts up the aperture which looks towards the north. If the south wind succeeds it the animal passes to the northern door. What lesson do these animals teach man? They not only show us in our Creator a care which extends to all beings, but a certain presentiment of future even in brutes. Then we ought not to attach ourselves to this present life and ought to give all heed to that which is to come. Will you not be industrious for yourself, O man? And will you not lay up in the present age rest in that which is to come, after having seen the example of the ant? The ant during summer collects treasures for winter, far from giving itself up to idleness, before this season has made it feel its severity, it hastens to work with an invincible zeal until it has abundantly filled its storehouses. Here again, how far it is from being negligent, with what wise foresight it manages so as to keep its provisions as long as possible. With its pincers it cuts the grains in half, for fear lest they should germinate and not serve for its food. If they are damp it dries them, and it does not spread them out in all weathers, but when it feels that the air will keep of a mild temperature. Be sure that you will never see rain fall from the clouds so long as the ant has left the grain out. What language can attain to the marvels of the Creator?
what ear could understand them, and what time would be sufficient to relate them. Let us say, then, with the Prophet, O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. We shall not be able to say in self-justification, that we have learned useful knowledge in books, since the untaught law of nature makes us choose that which is advantageous to us. Do you know what good you ought to do your neighbor? The good that you expect from him yourself. Do you know what is evil? That which you would not wish another to do to you. Neither botanical researches nor the experience of simples have made animals discover those which are useful to them, but each knows naturally what is salutary and marvelously appropriates what suits its nature. Virtues exist in us also by nature, and the soul has affinity with them not by education, but by nature herself. We do not need lessons to hate illness, but by ourselves we repel what afflicts us, the soul has no need of a master to teach us to avoid vice. Now all vice is a sickness of the soul as virtue is its health. Thus those have defined health well who have called it a regularity in the discharge of natural functions, a definition that can be applied without fear to the good condition of the soul. Thus, without having need of lessons, the soul can attain by herself to what is fit and conformable to nature. Hence it comes that temperance everywhere is praised, justice is in honor, courage admired, and prudence the object of all aims, virtues which concern the soul more than health concerns the body. Children love your parents, and you, parents provoke not your children to wrath. Does not nature say the same? Paul teaches us nothing new. He only tightens the links of nature. If the lioness loves her cubs, if the she-wolf fights to defend her little ones, what shall man say who is unfaithful to the precept and violates nature herself, or the son who insults the old age of his father, or the father whose second marriage has made him forget his first children? With animals invincible affection unites parents with children. It is the Creator, God himself, who substitutes the strength of feeling for reason in them. From whence it comes that a lamb as it bounds from the fold, in the midst of a thousand sheep recognizes the color and the voice of its mother, runs to her, and seeks its own sources of milk. If its mother's udders are dry, it is content, and, without stopping, passes by more abundant ones. And how does the mother recognize it among the many lambs? All have the same voice, the same color, the same smell, as far at least as regards our sense of smell. Yet there is in these animals a more subtle sense than our perception which makes them recognize their own. The little dog has as yet no teeth, nevertheless he defends himself with his mouth against any one who teases him. The calf has as yet no horns, nevertheless he already knows where his weapons will grow. Here we have evident proof that the instinct of animals is innate, and that in all beings there is nothing disorderly, nothing unforeseen. All bear the marks of the wisdom of the Creator, and show that they have come to life with the means of assuring their preservation. The dog is not gifted with a share of reason, but with him instinct has the power of reason. The dog has learned by nature the secret of elaborate inferences, which sages of the world, after long years of study, have hardly been able to disentangle. When the dog is on the track of game, if he sees it divide in different directions, he examines these different paths, and speech alone fails him to announce his reasoning. The creature, he says, is gone here or there or in another direction. It is neither here nor there, it is therefore in the third direction. And thus, neglecting the false tracks, he discovers the true one. What more is done by those who, gravely occupied in demonstrating theories, trace lines upon the dust and reject two propositions to show that the third is the true one. Does not the gratitude of the dog shame all who are ungrateful to their benefactors? Many are said to have fallen dead by their murdered masters in lonely places. Others, when a crime has just been committed, have led those who were searching for the murderers, and have caused the criminals to be brought to justice. What will those say who, not content with not loving the master who has created them and nourished them, have for their friends men whose mouth attacks the Lord, sitting at the same table with them, and, while partaking of their food, blaspheme him who has given it to them. But let us return to the spectacle of creation.
The easiest animals to catch are the most productive. It is on account of this that hares and wild goats produce many little ones, and that wild sheep have twins, for fear lest these species should disappear, consumed by carnivorous animals. Beasts of prey, on the contrary, produce only a few and the lioness with difficulty gives birth to one lion, because, if they say truly, the cub issues from its mother by tearing her with its claws, and vipers are only born by gnawing through the womb, inflicting a proper punishment on their mother. Thus in nature all has been foreseen, all is the object of continual care. If you examine the members even of animals, you will find that the Creator has given him nothing superfluous, that he has omitted nothing that is necessary. To carnivorous animals he has given pointed teeth which their nature requires for their support. Those that are only half furnished with teeth have received several distinct receptacles for their food. As it is not broken up enough in the first, they are gifted with the power of returning it after it has been swallowed, and it does not assimilate until it has been crushed by rumination. The first, second, third, and fourth stomachs of ruminating animals do not remain idle, each one of them fulfills a necessary function. The neck of the camel is long so that it may lower it to its feet and reach the grass on which it feeds. Bears, lions, tigers, all animals of this sort, have short necks buried in their shoulders, it is because they do not live upon grass and have no need to bend down to the earth, they are carnivorous and eat the animals upon whom they prey. Why has the elephant a trunk? This enormous creature, the greatest of terrestrial animals, created for the terror of those who meet it, is naturally huge and fleshy. If its neck was large and in proportion to its feet it would be difficult to direct, and would be of such an excessive weight that it would make it lean towards the earth. As it is, its head is attached to the spine of the back by short vertebrae and it has its trunk to take the place of a neck, and with it it picks up its food and draws up its drink. Its feet, without joints, like united columns, support the weight of its body. If it were supported on lax and flexible legs, its joints would constantly give way, equally incapable of supporting its weight, should it wish either to kneel or rise but it has under the foot a little ankle joint which takes the place of the leg and knee joints whose mobility would never have resisted this enormous and swaying mass. Thus it had need of this nose which nearly touches its feet. Have you seen them in war marching at the head of the phalanx, like living towers, or breaking the enemy's battalions like mountains of flesh with their irresistible charge? If their lower parts were not in accordance with their size, they would never have been able to hold their own. Now we are told that the elephant lives three hundred years and more, another reason for him to have solid and unjointed feet. But, as we have said, his trunk, which has the form and the flexibility of a serpent, takes its food from the earth and raises it up. Thus we are right in saying that it is impossible to find anything superfluous or wanting in creation. Well, God has subdued this monstrous animal to us to such a point that he understands the lessons and endures the blows we give him, a manifest proof that the Creator has submitted all to our rule, because we have been made in his image. It is not in great animals only that we see unapproachable wisdom, no less wonders are seen in the smallest. The high tops of the mountains which, near to the clouds and continually beaten by the winds, keep up a perpetual winter, do not arouse more admiration in me than the hollow valleys, which escape the storms of lofty peaks and preserve a constant mild temperature. In the same way in the constitution of animals I am not more astonished at the size of the elephant, than at the mouse, who is feared by the elephant, or at the scorpion's delicate sting, which has been hollowed like a pipe by the supreme artificer to throw venom into the wounds it makes. And let nobody accuse the Creator of having produced venomous animals, destroyers and enemies of our life. Else let them consider it a crime in the schoolmaster when he disciplines the restlessness of youth by the use of the rod and whip to maintain order. Beasts bear witness to the faith. Have you confidence in the Lord? Thou shall walk upon the asp and the basilisk and you shall trample under feet the lion and the dragon. With faith you have the power to walk upon serpents and scorpions. Do you not see that the viper which attached itself to the hand of Paul, while he gathered sticks, did not injure him, because it found the saint full of faith? 
if you have not faith, do not fear beasts so much as your faithlessness, which renders you susceptible of all corruption. But I see that for a long time you have been asking me for an account of the creation of man, and I think I can hear you all cry in your hearts, we are being taught the nature of our belongings, but we are ignorant of ourselves. Let me then speak of it, since it is necessary, and let me put an end to my hesitation. In truth the most difficult of sciences is to know oneself. Not only our eye, from which nothing outside us escapes, cannot see itself, but our mind, so piercing to discover the sins of others, is slow to recognize its own faults. Thus my speech, after eagerly investigating what is external to myself, is slow and hesitating in exploring my own nature. Yet the beholding of heaven and earth does not make us know God better than the attentive study of our being does. I am, says the prophet, fearfully and wonderfully made. That is to say, in observing myself I have known your infinite wisdom. And God said, Let us make man, Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Does not the light of theology shine, in these words, as through windows, and does not the second person show himself in a mystical way, without yet manifesting himself until the great day? Where is the Jew who resisted the truth and pretended that God was speaking to himself? It is he who spoke, it is said, and it is he who made. Let there be light and there was light, but then their words contain a manifest absurdity. Where is the smith, the carpenter, the shoemaker, who, without help and alone before the instruments of his trade, would say to himself, Let us make the sword, let us put together the plough, let us make the boot. Does he not perform the work of his craft in silence? Strange folly, to say that anyone has seated himself to command himself, to watch over himself, to constrain himself, to hurry himself, with the tones of a master. But the unhappy creatures are not afraid to calumniate the Lord himself. What will they not say with a tongue so well practiced in lying? Here, however, words stop their mouth, and God said let us make man. Tell me, is there then only one person? It is not written, let man be made, but, let us make man. The preaching of theology remains enveloped in shadow before the appearance of him who was to be instructed, but, now, the creation of man is expected, that faith unveils herself and the dogma of truth appears in all its light. Let us make man, O enemy of Christ, hear God speaking to his county operator, to him by whom also he made the worlds, who upholds all things by the word of his power. But he does not leave the voice of true religion without answer. Thus the Jews, race hostile to truth, when they find themselves pressed, act like beasts enraged against man, who roar at the bars of their cage and show the cruelty and the ferocity of their nature, without being able to assuage their fury. God, they say, addresses himself to several persons. It is to the angels before him that he says, Let us make man. Jewish fiction, a fable whose frivolity shows whence it has come. To reject one person, they admit many. To reject the son, they raise servants to the dignity of counselors. They make of our fellow slaves the agents in our creation. The perfect man attains the dignity of an angel. But what creature can be like the Creator? Listen to the continuation, in our image. What have you to reply? Is there one image of God and the angels? Father and Son have by absolute necessity the same form, but the form is here understood as becomes the divine, not in bodily shape, but in the proper qualities of Godhead. Here also, you who belong to the new concision, Philippians chapter 3 verse 2, and who, under the appearance of Christianity, strengthen the error of the Jews. To whom does he say, in our image, to whom if it is not to him who is, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, the image of the invisible God, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. It is then to his living image, to him who has said, I and my Father are one, John chapter 10 verse 30, he that has seen me has seen the Father, John chapter 14 verse 9, that God says, let us make man in our image. Where is the unlikeness in these beings who have only one image? So God created man, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. It is not, they made. Here scripture avoids the plurality of the persons.
after having enlightened the Jew, it dissipates the error of the Gentiles in putting itself under the shelter of unity, to make you understand that the Son is with the Father, and guarding you from the danger of polytheism. He created him in the image of God. God still shows us his cooperator, because he does not say, in his image, but in the image of God. If God permits, we will say later in what way man was created in the image of God, and how he shares this resemblance. Today we say, but only one word. If there is one image, from whence comes the intolerable blasphemy of pretending that the Son is unlike the Father. What ingratitude! You have yourself received this likeness and you refuse it to your benefactor. You pretend to keep personally that which is in you a gift of grace, and you do not wish that the Son should keep his natural likeness to him who begot him. But evening, which long ago sent the Son to the West, imposes silence upon me. Here, then, let me be content with what I have said, and put my discourse to bed. I have told you enough up to this point to excite your zeal. With the help of the Holy Spirit I will make for you a deeper investigation into the truths which follow. Retire, then, I beg you, with joy, O Christ-loving congregation, and, instead of sumptuous dishes of various delicacies, adorn and sanctify your tables with the remembrance of my words. May the Anamian be confounded, the Jew covered with shame, the faithful exultant in the dogmas of truth, and the Lord glorified, the Lord to whom be glory and power, world without end. Amen. Thank you for listening to this presentation. If you found it interesting and informative, I would humbly ask that you help support this ministry of spreading the knowledge of Christianity. Simply subscribe to this channel, give the video a thumbs up, and click on the notification bell. Any comments you may leave will be appreciated. You can also help spread the message of salvation by sharing this video on your social media pages. May God keep and bless you.